now you know. We're going to have a conversation uh, throughout the course of this next hour or so uh, with three people. So uh, my guest today, Mark Black, who is the uh, vice president of Black Source Group. He's a healthcare consultant, uh, a man about town, a man of many talents, uh, who I always enjoy talking with, and uh, we'll be hearing from him today. Also joining us are Michaela Cueto, who is the chapter lead of an organization called Achilles International. We're going to find out who she is and who they are as well today. And also we've got the race director from the Woodlands Marathon, Willie Folks. Now, you might be hearing me, and we've got a race director from the Woodlands Marathon, something called Achilles International, and the question you might have in your mind at this point is, what the heck does that have to do with mental health? So, we're going to have a conversation today about the intersection of both mental health and physical health. And Mark, you know, I was hoping you could uh, uh, help sort of pave the way for this roundtable we're going to have here. Um, how do these things connect? What's the point? Like, I, I mean, why are we talking today, I guess, is really uh, what I'd love to hear from you. Well, because I think, I think physical health, mental health, I mean, it's absolutely. obviously they're closely related. And maybe just say a little more about that. Right. Well, Chris, first I want to say um, good afternoon to the listening audience and thank you and Nani for having us on and um, being able to speak to how these, uh, these two things intersect. Um, the um, mental health community and uh, many psychiatrists, this is not a new topic or subject matter. Uh, I came into the fold around 1990, and there was a psychiatrist that was very big on integrating physical wellness with mental health wellness. And so the understanding on how that works, I'll get into it as our conversation continues onward. But um, uh, this is not anything new, um, uh, you know, um, physical actually reduces stress, yeah. uh, anxiety, yeah. depression, yeah. moods. So those things we'll get into, and I'll talk a little bit about more about the biological changes that happen with a person when they actively engage in running, yeah. walking, and other physical activities. So, I, and I'm hoping you can educate me a little bit about this because I'm I'm really happy to say that you know here today we are on the radio. We've just been listening to some great music. We're having this conversation about mental health and also physical health. And there's suddenly uh, I find myself at the intersection of a lot of things that have I've quickly become passionate about. So. I, you know, I grew up as a as a musician. I was not always the most physically active person because I lived in a practice room, uh, studying my instrument, playing my instrument, doing that all day, every day. Um, and more recently, I have discovered a love and a passion for things like walking and running. And it started as an effort to really uh, go to work on my own physical health. Um, what I've found is that it's become a critical piece of the pie, so to speak, uh, in managing my own mental health, you know, and uh, because, you know, I don't, I think, you know, uh, I'm like so many people, I've got, you know, 50 things going on at any one time, I've got family, I'm the only child of two aging parents, there's just, you know, a lot of things to consider, and what I've noticed is that as I've gotten into this pattern of everyday walking, everyday running, everyday some kind of physical activity, I start to get a little anxious. I start to get a little grumpy. I start to get a little grouchy mm -hmm. uh, when I'm not doing those things. And, and even if I'm not doing those things well, I've noticed that as long as I'm doing it, it makes just a profound difference in my own peace of mind and my own mental state. Well, speaking to that, Chris, um, when people used to come into uh, psychiatric hospitals and they stayed for a period of time, there were modalities that actually were put together to address those particular um, um, symptoms that you just you just described. And it was a person would do recreational therapy. Yeah. They would do uh, op occupational therapy. Then they would do biofeedback therapy. That was all three of those modalities were designed to reduce stress, reduce depression, address anxiety, address mood disorders. Mm. But out in the public, many people didn't know that. And since, you know, mental health and the way we treat mental health has 
transcend it into different ways, first of all. And um, and then when you look at runners and, you know, people say, well, why did I feel so good mm-hmm. after I ran, you know, for a while? Mm-hmm. You hear about runners high mm-hmm. and you say, well, what happens when a person runs and they start to experience a euphoric nature? Yeah. Well, then it's because your brain starts to do different things as a result of that. There are two different um, chemicals in the brain, norepinephrine and uh, endorphins, that both address directly how physical activity changes those chemistries in the brain. So with that said, healthy physical activity can stimulate that opportunity for the brain to regenerate and generate those two particular chemicals in the brain. Huh, that's fascinating. You know, and I think like a lot of people, you know, I think I, I think it, it, you don't have to try hard to get people to connect just general mental health with physical health, with physical activity. But the thing for me, and I, I don't think I, I don't think I'm unusual in this regard, is the idea that that those kinds of things can also be used as part of the treatment of somebody who might be dealing with a serious mental illness or you know something like very acute depression, very acute anxiety. So, you know, I have a family member who deals with acute depression and acute anxiety, and um, and walking is one of the things uh, that he is now doing every day, and that's a that's a new thing. You know, and I can see the difference that it makes. Right. You know, and I think it's also important to do that stuff in the daylight, too. Right. Well, you know, anxiety is something that we all experience. Yeah. Every one of us. And anxiety is is controlled in something on the inner mechanisms in your body called your fight or flight mechanism. Yeah. Which is like a light switch. You know, you experience uh, danger or something that is, um, um, that, that alerts you and Instantly, your body gets alerted and gets in a rigid, in a, in a ready to go or a ready to fight uh, mode. As that passes, your body relaxes. When people experience anxiety to the point that it no longer works, and the irritability, the, the, you can go into paranoia. But um, to that point, but what happens is is how that is all regimented through exercise, mm. again, is through these endorphin levels. And, and norepinephrine, in a lay term, means adrenaline. Ah, healthy okay. adrenaline. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Right, healthy adrenaline. So, you know, you get some adrenaline, you get some endorphins, which hits what's called the pleasure center of the brain, the hippocampus, which, which lies in the center of the brain and allows people to say, ah, oh, feel good. If you ran 15 miles, are you ran, he said, oh man, I'm just now, I'm really feeling good about that running. Yeah. That's because the brain is generating your endor- and upping your endorphin level. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so that's what's going on because I have actually, I'm a relatively new runner. I wouldn't say that I'm a great runner, but it is something that I've been doing very consistently for, uh, I don't know, about three, four months now. And um, uh, and when I say consistently, like five to six days a week, right? And, um, and I was out one time uh, recently on what for me at that moment was probably the longest distance I had run. And I did have this experience about halfway, maybe three quarters of the way through it, something happened. And I got that this rush, you know, and I think it's what you call that runner's eye, you know, and suddenly I felt better. I felt more excited. I found that I started running faster, even though I had been running for quite a distance at that point. Uh, so that's 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 very interesting to me. Um, that's uh, Mark Black, vice president of Black Source Group. He's a healthcare consultant uh, and uh, one of our guests today here on Now You Know. I'm Chris Johnson, and thanks so much for listening today. And I think what we're going to do next is take a short break uh, and go back to some music. Uh, and then we'll come back and we'll hear from our other guests. Uh, coming up, we're going to talk to Michaela Queto, who's the chapter lead of... It's now you know here on Amazing 102.5. I'm Chris Johnson. Thanks so much for listening today. It's an amazing pop-up show from NAMI Greater Houston. We're the local chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And today we're having a conversation about the intersection of mental health and physical health. On the program this afternoon, you heard from Mark Black just a little while ago, Vice President of Black Source Group Healthcare Consultants. Also with us uh, this afternoon is Michaela Queto, who is the chapter lead of Achilles International. Michaela, what is that? 
what what do y'all do? I, I you do very special work. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. Of course. Well, thank you for having me, and thanks to Nami for inviting me onto the show today. So we are a nonprofit that serves any person who's living with a disability, and we take all age levels. And we take kids, adults, veterans, anyone with a disability to participate in running or endurance sports. Oh, wow. Okay. And so, and, and then what do, what, so you're the chapter lead. Like, how does this work in our area? Like, tell, yes. tell me more. Because, you know, I, I can get it conceptually, but if I saw you at work, what would <laughs> I see you doing? Sure. So we were founded in New York City, um, and we host workouts twice a week. So we host workouts on Tuesday nights and Saturday mornings, and that just consists of people that just want to walk around the park, maybe get some movement in, but also we have athletes that are training to do a marathon. So we take all activity levels, we meet twice a week just to get together, and then we pair off and decide what we're going to do for that day. And so give me an example of somebody that might be training to run a marathon and yet has some kind of a a physical disability. Like what what kinds of people do you interact with? What kinds of things are they uh, transcending, if you will, as they're training for these races? So we have everyone. (laughs) I have athletes who are completely blind, low vision, a spectrum on the visually impaired. Um, I have athletes who are deaf, athletes who have autoimmune diseases, athletes who are amputees. Disabled vets, um, quadriplegics, paraplegics, everybody. <laughs> wow, wow. So what that looks like in races is if they are not able to ambulate, walk, run in a race, they would be in a hand cycle or maybe a racing chair, and they're always paired with a bike guide for their safety. And in races, they would be paired with an ambulatory guide that would either hold a tether if they're low vision um, or just as a support. Huh. Yeah. Wow. And one can only imagine the benefits to the mental health of somebody who might be dealing with uh, some kind of a disability or an impairment like that, who is at the same time doing something like running a marathon. Anything you want to say about that, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can say that um, I believe it, it crosses every spectrum, uh, the ability to uh, use uh, running and uh, any physical activity to um, minimize the stress level yeah. or the anxiety level or depression. I don't think it has to be a physically healthy person yeah. that that only applies to. Yeah. I think it, it can apply to any of those groups. Yeah. And so I just I just think that um, uh, you know you will see that um, by running it's a universal way of uh, dealing with some. Um, some stress and some anxiety. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, Michaela, I'm curious, since you've seen all of these types of people doing any number of things at any number of different levels, are there people or stories that really stand out to you in your experience? Of course. And I'll piggyback off of what Mark said. I think um, I myself have my own disability, and it ca- it gave me maybe 10 years to finally come to terms and feel, like, comfortable with, like, having a disability, like on job applications, I wouldn't put it on there. I didn't tell anybody about it. Um, And now I I don't really care. (laughs) It's just, it's a part of who I am. And I think that's what's really special about our community is that they just want to do a race just like everybody else. And if we have to break those barriers at the start lines, if that means like me speaking with race directors on how we can make the race more accessible, um, I'm willing to do it. And that's the best part is that I have... One athlete in particular, she came to me in November, and I it took forever to get her out to the park. <laughs> I text her week after week, and her friend comes regularly and was like, just keep messaging her. Like, yeah. maybe eventually she'll come out. <laughs> and I was feeling that I was being, like, kind of a bother because I would message her and be like, 9 a.m. this Saturday, see you there. And she wouldn't, <laughs> she wouldn't respond. <laughs> but my feelings towards that is if she doesn't say no, I'm going to keep messaging her. Right. When someone's like, hey, like, please remove me from the mailing list, then I'll, I'll take a hint, sure. and I won't message them anymore. But she, you know, she didn't ever respond. Yeah. So I kept messaging her, 9 a.m. this Saturday. And then finally she came out, and she was very much so that I'm in my 70s, 
I am not going to do any races. And I was like, that's fine. Like, I'll meet you where you're at. We could just do the mile loop around the park. Yeah. And then you could go home. Yeah. So that's what we did all of November. We just did the mile loop. She'd go home. That was it. Have the Houston Marathon weekend in January. And she kind of knew about it because her friend's doing it. But she was still very much so like, don't twist my arm. I'm not racing. I was like, <laughs> totally fine. And this athlete, she's low vision. Um, how she describes it is sh- when she opens her eyes, it's like driving at night without your headlights on yeah. is yeah. kind of how like she sees the world. Yeah. So we were always, I was always her guide at the practices and we would like work with the tether and we'd just walk. And then finally, the last week of December, she was like, you know what? Let me tell you, I got a membership at the YMCA and I've kind of been jogging on the side. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, so what does that mean? Registration was still open for the 5K. We weren't going to do anything crazy. Yeah. Um, so I told her, let's register. I'll be your guide. I've worked with you since November. And so this past, I mean, two weekends ago, we completed the 5K together. Come on. It was great. They announced our names, like, when we crossed the finish line. And I'd be lying if I said he did not cry. Because <laughs> it, was, it was just a really monumental moment for us. Uh, just coming from her... Um, pedaling back to the disability community and feeling like very marginalized and like you don't have those people and then overcoming that barrier and crossing that finish line was that was that's probably my best story (laughs) oh my goodness well I mean yeah and and it is very moving to hear you know because um you know I'm dealing with a mother whose health is declining right now and so I'm just like witnessing firsthand how significant you know uh, even a small accomplishment like you know I assume was she walking was she running so our deal was that she would jog across the finish line. She, yeah, exactly. But, but when she saw the finish line, we had like, I don't know, like 0.1 miles left, and she just started power walking. <laughs> She's like, no, we're getting there. We're going right now. <laughs> and then we did jog over the finish line, so we did keep that. Yeah, yeah. We hold, yeah. held that. And one thing I'm personally <laughs> learning uh, on my own little journey of uh, fitness is that um, getting to the starting line is often the hardest part. And then once you're there, you're there, but like just getting, making it from yep. the bed to the it's starting going line back. <laughs> is actually the most challenging part. And then once you're there, you know, the rest is kind of actually uh, not as difficult as it might seem. At least that's what I'm discovering. I would agree. Right. All right, good. Well, that's Michaela Cueto. She's the chapter lead of Achilles International. Uh, you're listening to Now You Know here on the amazing 102.5 FM. Don't go anywhere. We're going to come back after some music here, and we're going to hear from Willie Folks, who's the race director of the Woodlands Marathon. Stick around. You're listening to Now You Know, a amazing pop-up show here on Amazing 102.5 from NAMI Greater Houston, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I'm Chris Johnson. Thanks so much for listening this afternoon. Uh, With me today on the program, you've heard from Mark Black of Black Source Group, uh, healthcare consultants. Uh, we just talked with Michaela Queto, who is the chapter lead of Achilles International. And also in the program with us this afternoon is Willie Folks, who's the race director of the Woodlands Marathon. And, you know, we were just hearing from uh, Michaela about the population that she works with, training people with any number of kinds of disabilities or impairments to run. Do, do you see these people in your marathon? Most definitely. We are a big supporter of of these groups, these athletes with disabilities, is yeah. what we call them. Okay, gotcha. Well, talk to me about the talk to me about the marathon because you know people might hear a marathon and probably have a similar response that I did for the majority of my life, which is something on the on the order of um, I only run when being chased or something like that. And then as I've started to get more into this, one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, marathons races. Um, they're often not just about how fast you can run and blah, blah, blah. Like, like I'm sure there are groups of people that come and they are there to like see it, to set their personal record. But then there's a whole population of other people that might engage in a marathon for any number of reasons. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah, we, we're a Boston marathon qualifier, right? Okay. So we're certified through USA track and field. And, and so we brought this event back after a 19 year hiatus um, in 2012. And so we've been going for the last 11 years, but there are folks such as Michaela's group, uh, Achilles and, and NAMI. We have a lot of those guys that come out and they do charitable fundraising at our event. 
and the directors of the Woodlands Marathon Management Group has decided, we decided 11 years ago that we would create a prize purse for some of these folks to come in and raise money for their charities, hence our charity challenge up there. And, and it's just great. I mean, we're blessed to do what we do. Yeah. And these athletes with disabilities, it's, it's exciting to see them out there competing on the course and offering them an opportunity to improve their quality of life. You don't actually know what someone is doing and what's going on in their life until you actually start to see them celebrate their opportunities that we are giving them. And, and you know, being a new runner, mm -hmm. how important it is with your quality of life and what it's done for you. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's just I'm, I'm kind of shocked at myself because, you know, part of my my own personal story journey to NAMI, I mean, I do not have a background in mental health. Um, but like a lot of the people that we serve, I found myself uh, waking up one morning uh, about a year ago now, almost exactly a year ago, uh, and there was a mental uh, health emergency, if you will, uh, unfolding in my own home. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, through a series of serendipitous events, I, I got a random phone call that day from a woman who was calling the company that I work for, asking if somebody could introduce, uh, somebody could reach out to her friend a woman named Angelina, who I did not know. And I said, well, sure, I'll talk to Angelina as long as she wants me to. Um, and uh, tell me about her. And she says, well, she's the new executive director of NAMI Creative Houston. And I said, what's that? And, um, and so that was the very beginning of, you know, what has been like just a series of kind of epiphanies, light bulb moments, whatever you want to call it, where as I learned more, I suddenly started to look around me and I had been impacted by mental health, mental illness my entire life in any number of ways, right? And, uh, and then similarly, I, in, the, in the same sense that I, I, like a lot of people, didn't have much regard for mental health. Um, I also didn't really have much regard for physical health, you know? I mean, I grew up in a practice room studying violin, of all things, and I spent my days, you know, practicing the violin and, you know, rehearsing for this and playing for that, you know, and it just, and in fact, some physical activity I would in very purposely not engage in. Like, I've never been snow skiing. Because when I was a professional musician, you got to worry about breaking your clavicle, breaking your arms, breaking your hands. And I couldn't do that. It put me out of a job. Um, so, so I just didn't think about those things. And, uh, and then suddenly, you know, uh, I've had the opportunity to, like, experience how all of these things uh, connect. And, you know, I've also spent 20 years working in the nonprofit world. So when you start talking about things like a charity challenge and, you know, using something like uh, like a uh, like a race to contribute to the community as opposed to people just seeing how fast they could run that now suddenly you know the light bulbs are all going off so you have this charity challenge I know NAMI is a beneficiary of that um, I only see it from one side though which is to say that you know when I'm looking at our financials that periodically there's a series of transactions you know that say something about run sign up so so is it just that is how, how does this work how does this charity challenge work so Tiffany Rankin, who runs our charity challenge, she's our charity challenge coordinator uh, for the Woodlands Marathon. We, the directors, as I said before, created this charity challenge event where we will do a prize purse, right? So we've dedicated $12,500 to where charities can come in and raise money for their own charities through our event. We let them use our vehicle, i.e. the marathon, or the half marathon, or the 5K, or the 10K, or the 2K, to set up their own fundraising page. And once they set up their fundraising page, then they can share that. And everybody's seen that, right? You're raising money for an animal shelter or the Diabetes Association or something like that. Yeah. NAMI has been a part of the Charity Challenge since 2018. Mm -hmm. Achilles International has been a part of the uh, Charity Challenge since 2019. And so these organizations come in and we and they use this as one of their biggest fundraisers for the year. So now all of a sudden you were talking with Michaela about you know, just getting out there and doing this. Well, when you register, yeah. now you're on the clock. So, uh, <laughs> now you're on the clock, and now you're going, okay, I'm yeah. committed, I'm committed to do this. Well, when you put NAMI's fundraising page up there and it says $5,000, yeah. now you're on the clock, and yeah. you've got to do some of those things. So over the years, over the last 11 years, um, athletes and the Woodlands Marathon Management has raised and donated over $1.375 million wow in 11 years time and wow. so it's been great doing it for those charities and for the community and for individuals as a whole 
Well, I've noticed the, the, this, the, the practical side of what you're talking about, because I, as I start to run more and more consistently and more frequently, um, you know, the challenge uh, that I run into uh, occasionally um, is, is finding the motivation to just keep doing that. So, you know, if you're registered, if you're kind of on the hook, if you've let everybody know what you're doing and why you're doing it, then suddenly, you know, uh, I run out of excuses when I'm waking up early in the morning as to whether or not I'm going to get my tail out of bed and get out and hit the streets, uh, so to speak. So uh, more to come. Willie Falks uh, is who we've just been hearing from, race director of the Woodlands Marathon. Uh, we're going to hear some music, and we're going to come back and wrap up our conversation today uh, here on Now You Know, an amazing pop-up show from NAMI Greater Houston. That's the National Alliance on Mental Illness here on the amazing 102.5 FM. M-A-Z, Amazing 102.5, Houston. I love you guys. Home of the Amanda Sapp Morning Show. It's Now You Know here on Amazing 102.5. I'm Chris Johnson with an amazing pop-up show today from NAMI Greater Houston, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We are live here in downtown Houston from Bread of Life. And uh, with me uh, for this last, I don't know, better part of an hour or so, Mark Black, Vice President of Black Source Group. He's a healthcare consultant uh, and a man of many talents and much wisdom, I might say. Uh, Michaela Cueto, Chapter Lead of Achilles International. Uh, we just heard from Willie Folks, who's the race director of the Woodlands Marathon, and I wanted to come back to you, Mark, because one of the things um, that I've started to kind of clue into uh, in my own experience is that there, there's a certain amount of, like, I guess what I would call awareness that's called for when you're, when you're you know, committed to sort of managing your mental health, because if you don't know kind of where your head's at, so to speak, <laughs> then you can't do anything about it. And, and one of the things that I've noticed as I've been walking and running more is like the, the, one of the biggest values of it for me is that time by myself, you know, during which time I do any number of things. You know, I might, you know, give myself a problem to solve, so to speak. Or if I've got a big event coming up, I've got to, like, think through a timeline or something like that. I'll give myself a little project to do while I'm out uh, on the road. But, um, but then also, you know, there's the, the other benefit of just kind of letting my mind wander at times, you know. Um, and, and all of that gets me connected to what it is that's going on with me internally. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the word for that that people use is uh, something called mindfulness. Is that, am, I, am I right there? <clears throat> well, you are right, uh, Chris. Um, mindfulness is a product of cognitive functioning. Yeah. And so when we talked a little earlier uh, in, our, in our broadcast, in our show, about... Um, the chemical called norepinephrine. Mm -hmm. It actually so is that's the good, that's like norepinephrine, uh -huh. and and so that is the one chemical that actually helps control cognitive functioning, okay. focus, being able to sleep, being able to think with focus, because you can think and be totally out of sync. <laughs> yes, and so um, um, that particular chemical helps you. So what does running? What does physical activity do? it actually helps the body produce more of that chemical. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. And then another thing you were talking about, uh, you know, while we were listening to that last uh, song, the there's a other component here that's like, uh, I think you would say is probably critical, uh, which is what? You're absolutely right. Developing a sense of, or uh, developing relaxation techniques. Okay. So physical activity along with relaxation techniques, you just got through running and you've ran that uh, and you're ex super excited. How do I come down off of that? Yeah. How do I let my body now relax? And yeah. there's something called, uh, there's a number of different uh, stress management tools, uh, deep muscle relaxation, progressive relaxation. But these are things you can even teach your mother while she's a, sitting uh -huh. in a chair. Yeah. So deep muscle, deep breathing, progressive, the tightening and tensing of muscles, tensing and releasing the muscle tension. Muscle tension is the prerequisite 
of stress, whether the body wants positive stress or negative stress. Huh. I'm running. Now I need to get, bring my body. You don't want to go home feeling the same way because your body was ready when it was running. Yeah. So it's the, the ability for the mind to slow down and know that it's now in a relaxed state. So those two, that activity and relaxing is married at the hip. And some people know how to do a lot of activities, right? but they still don't know how to relax. Uh, yeah, I would so, consider myself to be one of those people. Um, keep going. <laughs> so so, so there is programs out there, and there's a program, by the way, and I didn't describe some of my uh, history. I am a biofeedback therapist that have not practiced since 1998. I went into business development and been in it ever since, but my education and training, how I got into behavioral health, was that the owners of Intracare Hospital built the biofeedback lab and sent me back to school. So <laughs> that, in regard to that, um, the subject matter that we're talking about is why I'm able to speak to activity and how mental health affects it. I have always wondered that about you, Mark. <laughs> so that just explains a lot about uh, you know what you sort of bring to the table or to a conversation like the one we're having. That makes so much sense. And like, it also makes me think of like, like another sort of light bulb moment for me is that, um, in addition to like an awareness about maybe what's going on with regards to my mental state, if you will, I also didn't have much distinction around what was going on with my physical self, right? So yeah, I, Willie's over here laughing. I think you can relate. Like, so I went through this time where I just ha I kept having all these problems with my feet, right? And, and then at one point, I was, I was starting to develop tendinitis in one of my feet, and I thought this was all running related. But it turns out, I do have some experience with being hyper aware about things like tendinitis from my background as a musician, you know, you're doing repetitive movements over and over and over and over and over again all day. Um, but what I noticed is that the issue with my foot might have been exacerbated by the, the miles I was putting on my feet. But really what was going on is I do this weird thing with my foot when I drive. And it turns out the seat of my car is a little too close to the gas pedal. And so my right foot mm. stays in this constantly tense and very unnatural position. And then you add to that, you know, running miles every day. And suddenly, you know, I'm on the verge of, like, honestly, just not being able to walk. Um, <laughs> but I needed, I, I, but I was, but I had been experiencing this pain or these sensations for some time. But wasn't really aware of it, you know. You, you know, it's like you know, you just don't feel right, you know, or there's something wrong. But like until you stop and you take a look and say, "Oh, wait, it's this or it's that," you know, then you won't necessarily know how to act upon whatever it is. Yeah, go ahead, Willie. Yeah, you know, a lot of people, especially when they're training, like Michaela shared that story with the athlete. Yeah. Uh, that that she got to the 5K start line and finish line. Um, you know. A lot of people just lean on other people, yeah. lean on the professionals when you're having something like that. Some are afraid to ask those things, but Mark sh shared a lot of great information that I can relate to on the mental fitness side of things. Hmm. And we see it, you know, folks will go out there and they'll run and they won't run their best race or they'll try to qualify for the Boston Marathon and then their mental fitness is out the door. Oh, yeah. And they yeah. beat themselves up, you yeah, know. Yeah, so. yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Well, that's Willie Folks, race director of the Woodlands Marathon. Uh, by the way, when is the marathon? It's coming up soon, I think. So we call it Marathon Week. Our 5K and 2K is February 25th. Yeah. The 5K is at 7.30 in the morning, and the 2K is at 9 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. And then our 10K half marathon and marathon is March 4th with our expo on March 3rd, and that's a 6.45 a.m. start for those events, so. And for anyone listening that, like, you know, marathon running is not their thing, I, I think you've got options for them, too. You mentioned it, like a 2K, like... The six. whole family can come out and play, Chris. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they can volunteer. We do donations to volunteer organizations. Um, you can come out and cheer on folks. Um, there's about 20,000 people that show up that day, but if they want more information on any of that, just go to thewoodlandsmarathon.com. Awesome. And then Michaela, uh, do you, so you do things regularly? Like if we, if people were interested in maybe contributing or it, maybe perhaps getting trained, like if they want to find out more, where do they go? What do they do? So we do our workouts at Stude Park in the Heights. Uh, more specific would be on our webpage at 
achilleshouston.org so they can find the exact location and the days and times that we meet. And then for our more serious athletes, our next race would actually be the Woodlands Marathon. So oh, we, come will, on. we will be there. <laughs> Yippee. Awesome. And it's achillesinternational.org? It's achilleshouston.org. Achilleshouston.org. I should also put a little plug in uh, for those people who aren't uh, maybe quite as athletic uh, to register and run a marathon or something like that. We do have this thing coming up in May that any people who know NAMI will have heard of. It's called the NAMI Walk. Not a run. It's not uh, 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 approved by the National Athletic or whatever. We, it, it's about three miles. <laughs> and you can walk as much of it or as little of it as you like. And although we have not officially launched it yet, I guess we're doing that right now, uh, you can find more information at namiwalks.org slash Greater Houston. And we'll talk more about that on upcoming episodes of this amazing pop-up show. Um, and then, uh, Mark, um, if people are interested in more about who you are and what you do, is there a place to direct them? Yes. You Other can than sim- your phone number? You can <laughs> simply have them email me. Yeah. I'm on Facebook. Yeah at Black Resource Healthcare Consultants, and you can certainly inbox me uh, at any time. I am um, open to uh, any conversation in trying to help people and provide professional uh, resources to those that may need it. Wonderful. Well, Mark, Willie, Michaela, thank you so much. Thank you, Willie, for making the trek down from the Woodlands to be here with us in downtown Houston. Thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us here on Amazing 102.5. I'm Chris Johnson. This has been an amazing pop-up show from NAMI Greater Houston. That's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Now you know. And uh, coming to you here on Amazing 102.5 FM, thanks uh, to the support of General Manager Amanda Sapp, uh, Executive Director of NAMI Greater Houston, uh, Angelina Hudson, and of course, all of this would not be possible uh, without the support of Pastors Rudy and Juanita Rasmus. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening. Stick around. More great music coming up here on The Amazing 102.5.